to hear some poetry. It is National Poetry Month, and our library decided to make sure that they sort of use this as a kickoff for a grant that they got to actually help the li library expand on the materials that they have about Islam and Muslim life and culture. So welcome to our poetry night in honor of the Muslims Journeys Bookshelf. The National Endowment for the Humanities is conducting a special initiative that brings cultures together and wants to engage people in the power of the humanities to promote an understanding of and a mutual respect for people from diver diverse um, cultures and backgrounds and perspectives. We want to do all this right here within the United States. So again, thank you for coming out. The Muslim Journeys Bookshelf is part of this initiative and is co-sponsored by the American Library Association. So please take some time throughout the rest of the school year and next school year to check out the Muslim um, Journeys Bookshelf that's downstairs and check out the circulation desk because they have some materials on um, hand now and they should be getting more materials. In, in the coming year, you also want to check out the library and see what other events that they're planning. So this is sort of the kickoff event. I know they're planning at least a couple of film viewings and there's one that I am just really looking forward to seeing and it's called Prince. Is it called Prince Among Slaves? I think so, yeah. All right. Because I was up late, way late one night and that's when all the really good stuff comes on TV. And I said, this sounds so cool. And, they, and when I was in a meeting, said, we actually have this documentary. It's called Prince Among Slaves. I'm like, I have to check that out because I, I'm sorry. I know I'm diverging now, but it's such a great story that I saw late night. <laughs> and I went online and tried to find it, and I couldn't find this documentary anywhere. But apparently, here's the short version that I got at 3 a.m. and found my internet search. It's about um, an African prince who in, a, in some war that was going on got captured and then he got sold into slavery. He came to the US as a slave and then 30 some years later, <laughs> he actually won his freedom. But he got his freedom because there was um, a doctor who came to the plantation. Now this is just doesn't make any sense at all. But the doctor happened to come to the plantation that the prince slave was living at and he recognized him because that doctor had once visited his kingdom in Africa and this guy's father hosted him. So he knew like you shouldn't be a slave and then he started this 30 year crusade to try to free him. Doesn't that sound interesting? Like oh, I want to see that and guess what? We have it in our library because of this initiative. So we have cool things like that. So make sure you're checking your email and the web page for all these cool events in the next school year. All right, so that's my, I went way off script with that, but I still have to watch that documentary. Okay, so we have a couple of changes to our program tonight. We had one poet, Cornelius Shaw, who couldn't come today because he had car trouble and he lives in Grand, you know, that's Grand Rapids, that wouldn't make any sense. He lives in Kalamazoo, so his He's very, very sad that he couldn't make it here today, and I just got that information from him earlier today. Um, so we have, so far, one less poet, and we have another poet who should make it here tonight, and he's running a little late, because today of all days, his company decided to send him, send him to another location to work, and it's further away from us than he ever expected. So he's like, I'm gonna get there as soon as I can. But the good news is we do have five poets here tonight, and they're going to share some of their work with you. And first up, we have <coughs> Carrie Moss. Carrie Moss is taking a creative writing class here at GRCC. She actually has a, a bachelor's degree in English. Um, she studied and lived six years in France, and that's where she got her degree. And she does a lot of things, but one of the things that um, she told me that she really does, she really enjoys is being an interpreter. So that's some of the thing, one of the things that she does here. So first up, we have Carrie Moss. So can we give her a round of claps? Thank you. Okay, so I'm gonna be reading some of my poetry that I've written for um, both the class and for publication. 
And the first one is called The Earth. The solitude of wisdom's repression, the attitude of winter's mist, wild sin, kiss of a lonely star. I heinously stand among the lilies of the valley. I watch them grow and wither. No man has seen the dust of the moon's remorse, following the sun, the lonely chase, the frowning. Hitherto, when I scan the sky, I see the lamps in the nearest heavens, recoiling at the thought of another year's feverish light. To me, the earth feels cold. I shiver in the waking of the yarrow. I cry when I see the fawn. Lest you wake me from this somnolent waltz, I shall never greet the sun, nor shall I love. This mild birth, this spring, beseech me. Call me to the lair of the humble. Become the enemy's martyr. Okay, this next one is called Sigh. Silhouette sold your body. Sit down on the fire. Sighs mildly burn the fragrant lilac. Woe begone estuary, forgiven but forgotten as well. I smell the flowers. We believe in water lilies. We suddenly, solemnly beseech the heavens with molecules forming the body. Reason is wild, thinking it's night. I'm wishing the darkness away. Peace on you, sigh. A messenger, peace, cornaline. Okay, uh, this one is called So Long. Woe begone lies, the yarrow stings the sun's rays. Like moss on a tree, the Nile forbids the light. So long, little doll, so long, lonely sighs of mist. Moaning for a light to breathe into my sun. Wishing you a life, a blessed myrrh. Becoming thine enemy is wishful. Poison rays of the moon startle me with your forlorn lisping. Wide earth, the dying lily cries in a tongue unknown to my love. I, for one, will listen with my solar wind. Lily of the valley, love me. Sigh of war, beseech me. Night to the lovers who first met with angels all around. Never part, sigh with me. Blessed holy lily, I need the sigh you sing. By light, this time is yours. And this one is called Under the Roses. Ides of the woe we believe in. My enemy bleeds the holy musk that you die in. The times we bleed the su sun's effervescent light are among the homeless, the yesterdays, and the end. Whisper now so they, the enemies, won't find your gold, your sun, and my day. They wish we were under the roses. They burden me with their dark weapons made of sin and death. The humans on this earth are waiting for the one thing they cannot avoid, the dying lilies of winter, seizure, holy seizure. Okay, this one is called The Darkness. Time has spoken its rhyme, and love has blown the lilies all around the gardens. Meanwhile, your face is like a bridge to the knife, the knife whose tine burns the skies with blessings. Woe begone angels caress the lower heavens. They cry for mercy on you and me. We take the sins we have committed and we run through this wild world. It burns our hearts like Moses and the flames. Be the night, be the day, idle file of sin and gold. Meet me in the starry skies. We will laugh and play with the end. We are the lilies of the valley. Together we roam the wild jungle of America. I saw the night, it led me to a wishing of bliss and little black loves. Tis the night I cry for doom. Tis the sun whose night follows in due time. Listen to the willows singing. They cry out for love in the noon breeze. Bond of grass, hum the orchid. Speak to me in a tongue unknown and holy. Lila, the night, she wakes me with her glance of the moon and the stars. Lila, rise and fall, Lila, rise and fall, die. Um, and the next ones I'm gonna read are actually gonna be published in a magazine called Big Scream that comes out January 2004, so you all should check that out. Uh, this first one is called Rise. I'm watching your face through the looking glass of wild time. Another asteroid, another universal mo movement has shaken the night. I saw you last when you were a child inside the solemn womb. The days were long and the estuary brought news from the east. I wonder if you know me, if you love me, 
I was yours, and you were the darkness that shaded my life. Together we bled, together we fought. A man has no family when the earth itself is functioning on five million years of wild time. Together we bl bled. Um, this one is called The Garden. I saw yellow yarrow growing in the garden when spring is whispering lilies and fawns. She has become the enemy of life. More and more they bleed. Fawn of the deer, behold the sky asunder. Man has become the east, and the west is burning life as lo a log that murders the sky. I know the end. I find the friend of destitute men and women, scars on my white life. Bleed the yarrow of the garden. This one is just untitled. Tomorrow is the last of the Nile. The scarred rhythm of the waves is wonder and beauty. Tonight, the man of one mind is wishing consciousness away. Feeble and weak are my enemies, the first and the last. Song of songs, behold the mystery of wisdom. Tomorrow, we bleed the Nile. Its mild knife will cut the blazing sun. Sigh, I belong to no man. My humble rejection is waning with the skies asunder. Mascot of doom, I see the life of God's wild will. Fine article, be mine. Um, this last one is called The Tide. Bones of the wind shake. By and large, the tide is swallowing the yellow yarrow's soul. Mist, rain, fog, the elements bold display. We belong to the earth. We are the winds gone by. Take of what you will, it's yours. For a time we spend, it's all glass, glass breaking. My tide breaks, moan the stars, marry the willows. Many a friend has died inside the yesterdays and tomorrows. Silhouette of winter's yesterday. Follow the wind. I am him. Yesterday. The tide is now bonds. Okay, so you now you know that you're supposed to look for Ms. Moss's pieces in the big screen in 2014, right? Would you believe, you have to give her another hand, this was her very first public reading. So, um, we are going to go on and introduce our next poet. Our next poet is G.F. Porrick. And he has been writing for quite a while. He's actually um, published in the Song of the Awashtanog, which is a new anthology that was edited by David Cope, who is a professor here at Grand Rapids Community College. And the library is working on getting copies of this. So you can check it out also. So they, um, all of the poets in this piece are Grand Rapids area based poets. So that's another interesting part of the anthology. So you can buy the anthology, by the way, at Schuler's Books, or just wait until we get here at the library too and check it out. You're gonna want one anyway. So just let you know that that's where you can get it. All right, so up next is G.F. Corrick. I'm going to read a couple of poems by other people and a couple of my own. First one I'm going to read is by a writer named William Stafford. And the reason I'm reading this is because we're talking about culture, talking about connecting with each other through culture. And there's one of his poems that I've always liked that does that very thing because we can't get anywhere as a people until we listen and hear and actually see each other. And that's pretty much what this poem is about. It's called A Ritual to Read to Each Other. If you don't know the kind of person I am, and I don't know the kind of person you are, a pattern that others made may prevail in the world, and following the wrong God home, we may miss our star. For there is many a small betrayal in the mind, a shrug that lets the fragile sequence break, 
sending with shouts the horrible errors of childhood, storming out to play through the broken dike. And as elephants parade holding each elephant's tail, but if one wanders, the circus won't find the park. I call it cruel, and maybe the root of all cruelty to know what occurs, but not recognize the fact. And so I appeal to a voice, to something shadowy, a remote, important region in all who talk. Though we could fool each other, we should consider, lest the parade of our mutual life get lost in the dark. For it is important that awake people be awake, or a breaking line may discourage them back to sleep. The signals we give, yes or no, or maybe, should be clear. The darkness around us is deep. And there are a couple of Islamic poets that I'd like to read. Uh, one is Rumi, and his translation is by Coleman Barks. Um, if you know, a lot of people know Rumi. They may not know him by name, but his, his work, his influence is noticed all throughout North America and in, in the West by other writers. The title of this one is The Dream Must Be Interpreted. This place is a dream. Only a sleeper considers it real. Then death comes like dawn, and you wake up laughing at what you thought was your grief. But there's a difference with this dream. Everything cruel and unconscious, done in the illusion of the present world, all that does not fade away at the death waking, it stays and it must be interpreted. All the mean laughing, all the quick sexual wanting, those torn coats of Joseph, they change into powerful wolves that you must face. The retaliation that sometimes comes now, the swift payback hit, is just a boy's game to what the other will be. You know about circumcision here. It's full castration there. In this groggy time we live, this is what it's like. A man goes to sleep in the town where he has always lived, and he dreams he's living in another town. In the dream, he doesn't remember the town he's sleeping in his bed in. He believes the reality of the dream town. The world is that kind of sleep. The dust of many crumbled cities settles over us like a forgetful doze but we are older than those cities. We began as a mineral. We emerged into plant life and into the animal state and then into being human. And always we have forgotten our former states, except in early spring when we slightly recall being green again. That's how a young person turns toward a teacher. That's how a baby leans toward the breast. Without knowing the secret of its desire, yet turning instinctively. Humankind is being led along an evolving course through this migration of intelligences. And though we seem to be sleeping, there is an inner wakefulness that directs the dream and that will eventually startle us back to the truth of who we are. The second one is from a writer named Hafiz. It's interesting about him, he's also an Islamic poet. There is nothing that anyone's been able to find extant in his own hands, so all the work that's been attributed to him has been handed down vocally because he used to sing his work. The title of this poem is, I have come into the world to see this. I have come into this world to see this. The sword dropped from men's hands, even at the height of their arc of anger because we have finally realized there is just one flesh to wound, and it is his, the Christ's, our beloved. I have come into this world to see this. All creatures hold hands as we pass through this miraculous existence we share on the way to even a greater being of soul, a being of ecstatic light, forever entwined and at play with him. I have come into the world to hear this. Every song the earth has sung since it was conceived in the divine's womb and begins spinning from his wish. Every song by wing and fin and hoof, 
Every song by hill and field and tree and woman and child, every song of stream and rock, every song of tool and lyre and flute, every song of gold and emerald and fire, every song the heart should cry with magnificent dignity to know itself as God. For all other knowledge will leave us again in want and aching. Only imbibing the glorious sun will complete us. I have come into the world to experience this. Men so true to love, they would rather die before speaking an unkind word. Men so true, their lives are his covenant, the promise of hope. I have come into this world to see this. The sword drop from men's hands, even at the height of their arc of rage, because we have finally realized there is just one flesh we can wound. Anyway, after reading those and, and thinking some, I decided that uh, there are a couple of things I wrote that I'd like to read as well. One plays off the last two readings to some extent. It's called In Search of Light. In a world with, in which we cannot live, we laugh. We awaken and remain awake. We accept all beneath it, greet morning as we greet each breath. In a world in which we cannot feed ourselves, we devour death, return to mineral, to seed, to life, where love is sustenance. In a world that we cannot tolerate, we close our eyes, open our arms, embrace all that we can imagine. In a world that we cannot understand, we stop speaking, tilt our heads, listen to every voice, hear the music. In a world of darkness, we move deliberate and with confidence, faith in our footsteps, faith in our knowledge, in our touch, then what it, that when it is the right time, we will find light. The last poem is, is it's almost like a call to action, I guess. Uh, as I'm sure you can see by looking at me that I'm probably not 20-something. Um, Bob Dylan is a young guy to me, so. This is called A Requiem for Prematurity, and it's based on a line by Gregory Corso, who wrote, I hate old poet men. They are still here, sitting on benches, watching sunsets, whistling at dowagers, quoting dust. Make them leap from rooftops, ride moonlight into dawn, into the ears of the deaf, the eyes of the blind, the hearts of the lame, the souls of the dead. Let them eat wasted youth. Let them eat dreams left behind. Let them eat old words until their tongues taste new. Call Whitman's ghost, Eliot's mother, Pound's ego, Rumi's spirit. Give them banjos, bugles, drums, cast trash can lids. Push them from well-lighted rooms into alleys, dark corridors, noisy streets, the 40-watt life of those who live hungry. Sing, old poet men, now more than ever, over the numbing drone, over the dull echo of politicians, over the harsh pounding of artificial saviors, over the empty clang of civic righteousness, over the sharp hiss of bigotry, over the relentless thumping of boots and bombs. Embrace the subtle timber of love. Rise from your benches. It is long past sunset. There is nothing left to stop you. Thank you. Thank you. Are you doing okay? How many people would be in class right now if you weren't right here? Raise your hands. All right, we're all, all right. Keep them up if you just want me to send you back to class. Okay. Um, so before I introduce the next poet, um, I'm going to read a piece that was emailed to me by a student. Um, and he said, if you want to read it, go ahead, and I tried to convince that person to show up and be here. He's like, no, but you can read it for me. And since we are sharing, 
I decided, okay, I'll read it for you. The student is a student here at Grand Rapids Community College. His name is Ahmad Hamza, and it is untitled. So I'll read that piece for you, share that with you, and then I'll introduce the next poet. It was through him that the prophethood was sealed, and through him the holy book revealed. Mecca born during the elephant year, an early aged orphaned, speaking only truth made speech eloquent. Caretakers and faith earned him title of El Amin. He was also known for helping, did business for Khadija with such success, she asked for his hand to which he said yes. He secluded himself in the mountains to empty his illiterate head. An angel came to him and spoke read he did not know how, and so the angel started to squeeze, till finally he recited and wrote God's words, and the angel began releasing. He was in such shock, he thought he had been possessed, but he always did good and had never transgressed. He told Khadija what had transpired. Instead of worry, she became inspired. She became the very first to accept she knew that this was not a man-made concept. At first, he only told his nearest of kin. He warned them that to shirk is the worst of sins. They also believed with what he was preaching and also began to follow his teachings. It was revealed he had to proclaim to all, but not everyone would accept this call. At first, he was no threat because his followers poor, but each day that passed, he gained more. Powerful others became upset. They started pros prosecuting and making examples, instilling fear by using some as samples. In the face of this, to their faith, they remained, even though they were being harshly constrained until the prophet ordered them migrate. They left everything in their entire estates. The prophet was among the last to remain, leaving the same night he was to be slain. The journey was long, but clear in destination. The non-believers in Mecca were still angry he'd escaped. I missed the line, I'm gonna do that. Take two. The journey was long but clear in destination. No longer practicing in secret, they had emancipation. And other religions, he did not, he did not discriminate, though the non-believers were still angry he escaped. The tribes, he slowly began to reshape. Uniting them all under one truth, inspired many, especially the youth. It was in Badar that the war was raged. Though few in number, they still engaged. And in the end, the Muslims came out atop, but the hostility had not stopped. The Battle of Yuhid took a swift, took a swift in turn. To the Muslims, it became a lesson well learned. The battle of the trench became the decider. Muslims were outnumbered, but Allah was provider. The Muslims won and were now in command, and the idols of the, of the Kaaba they forever banned. With the house of Allah once again restored, filling his mission, he returned to his Lord. Again, that's by Hamza, Ahmed Hamza. And our next poet, Oh, we can give him, we'll give him a clap. I'll give him a clap for him. He's out here. Um, and our next poet coming to the stage is Khadija, the poet. And Khadija is the second of seven children in a family that's very creative and originally from New York. So, welcome, Khadija. Thank you. Um, 
I first want to greet you guys with the Arabic word peace, which means assalamu alaikum. So that's peace. Thank you. This first one is about um, prayer. We say prayer five times a day. So the poem uh, is in reference to that. It's called No Time to Cry. As I wake, I must say bismillah, which means in the name of God. As I wake, I must say bismillah, another day is here. I must fight off my sleep. It's time for the Fajr prayer. The afternoon is peaking. The sun's decline from the zenith is near. I must get into position and say the Zura prayer. It's time to say Salat again, for it's Allah I fear. Once again, I must repent and say the Arsa prayer. As the night begins to show its face, the dawn of day is here. It's time to give thanks to Allah and say the Maghrib prayer. I must concentrate on the positive things before I shed a tear. In this dean, there's much to learn. Now it's time for the Isha prayer. Before I go to sleep at night, I want to feed my head. It's good to read the Quran before I go to bed. Life can pass away from us faster than the blink of an eye. When I spend my time embracing this dean, there is no time to cry. My next one is called Stranger Passing By. I saw a stranger passing by one day. By far, I didn't know what to say. I looked at her and asked, is everything OK? A face of desperation, disillusioned, she didn't reply. But I could see she was troubled by the look that danced in her eye. I seen her somewhere before, a familiar face indeed. I must think of something fast. She looks like she's in need. At last, I remembered her name. As I cried out, she turned to see. To much to my surprise, the stranger passing by was me. Now the moral of that story is, if you're blessed with knowledge, don't put it on the shelf, because you may lose sight of who you are and become a stranger to yourself. This next one is called Every Street Has a Name. Have you ever tried to get to a place that seems so far to you? And then you're asking yourself over and over again, do you know where you're going to? Well, I know the place, and helping others is my goal. I have directions to a street called Help You Save Your Soul. We all lose our way sometimes, and that's not very odd. Let me tell you how to get to a path that leads to obeying God. You don't need a pen or paper. Just memorize this in your heart. Please listen up very closely, because now the directions will start. First, go down to Belief Street. The line is always green, so please don't hesitate. Next, take a U-turn down Faith Street, and then keep going straight. You'll run into Discipline Avenue, then you know you're going right. Because once you see the street, you'll start to see the light. Finally, you'll run to an intersection where the road comes to a split. There's a street called Wrong Path. Take the road called I Submit. If you're lost, ask for directions, or you'll have yourself to blame. Every street has a stein, and every street has a name. This last one I want to read is called Represent. Now, once again, when I say the word Allah, it's Arabic, and it means God. I am who I am, Allah's creation, made from the germ in the womb's plantation. All praises are due to Allah from where I was sent, and Allah I will return, and I will represent. My deen I shall strive for every step of the way, Obeying my nature as a Muslim, praying five times a day. Allah is my provider, my security, my tent. And inshallah, I shall represent. Guiding me 
on a straight way where my path was quite bent, the creator of the heavens and the earth, and I shall represent. The battle with myself is all my time spent, and inshallah, I will represent. To be granted with paradise a thought so pleasant, I submit totally to the will of Allah, and I shall represent. Thank you. Okay, so we're getting through this poetry reading, aren't we? Are you still doing okay? I think you're doing so well. We have two poets left, so one, and I'm one of them. But I figured this is a good time to say, mm, what do you think so far? Okay, any questions? Any comments? No? This is your chance to ask, like, cultural stuff. Like, I want to ask this question. All right, well, well I'm going to try that again later at the end. So if you think through when you're listening to the poets, hold on to something so that you can talk to them at the end and say, hey, can we chit chat about something that you just said? Um, but I want to tell you a little bit, since this is about bringing cultures together, my name is Morsalata Muhammad. I'm from Detroit, Michigan. And when I was in college, most people didn't believe I was from Detroit, Michigan. They're like, where are you really from? Because your name, or they'd say, what was your name before it was Morsalata Muhammad? Does anybody have any idea why I would get that question? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, and that was the first time when I was in college that I realized that my colleagues and my classmates in college didn't had never known like a black African American Muslim from birth, so they didn't. They're like, well, you have to be from another country or you convert it. But no, I have twelve brothers and sisters. I was number twelve. My younger brother was lucky number thirteen, and he and I were fortunate enough to be born after our parents converted to Islam. And I say fortunate because you have 11 people in a family who are Christians. And then you have parents who decide they're gonna change everything. I'm so glad they did that before I was born because my brothers and sisters were not, they were just, they were an interesting group of people. Um, so I grew up in a household where the, the age difference between me and the next person is about seven years, seven, eight, almost 10 years. So I was really a whole different group. So I grew up in a household where my brothers, some of my brothers and sisters were adults. I could literally go to their house and kind of sort of celebrate Christmas because they, she'd grown up celebrating Christmas. And she said, I can do everything. I could do everything mom wanted us to do, but I could not give up presents at Christmas. So it was interesting. You're talking about blending of cultures. When you live in one, it's some, everybody's doing some of everything. It's fun. And I have, lo I have lots of stories just because I have 12 brothers and sisters. But that was an interesting thing. So being in, trying to blend all these things. And then I grew up and I married someone who was not Muslim. So my husband, when we got married, was not Muslim. So this whole ch asking questions and stuff is, is a good idea. And, make sure that you notice that the poets we have reading here are not all one thing or another. So we have diversity for you tonight. And speaking of, to come and deliver you some more is David W. Landrum, who is also in the book that I showed earlier today. So if you like his pieces, is it? Yeah. They're gonna hurry up and get in the library so you can read more. <laughs> all right, thank you. Please welcome David. Thank you. I've got, uh, got two poems um, to read of my own. These are fairly new. I'm doing the 30-30 challenge for National Poetry Month, trying to come up with a new poem every day. And so far, I've done it. And uh, so these are sort of in response to this. And I'm going to say a little uh, about both of them. Then I have a cover, another poet's poem to read. This first one is called Arabesque. And um, 
I hope I'm not insulting your intelligence, but an arabesque is a kind of design. There were some Muslim countries, now not all of them, where um, they didn't like artists to represent the human form or animal forms. So when they would do a palace or a mosque, they would put very elaborate geometrical designs that were symmetrical and really very intricate. And uh, so this first one is arabesque. And the name, the French called it that, means Arab-like or in, in the style of Arab art, right? So arabesque. The swirls. No graven images could show of anything in heaven or in earth. And in response to this, the artist drew vast linear designs that swirled like birds filling the sky. White patterns drawn against blue, woven in a complex symmetry, done to perfection. God's handiwork sensed and mirrored by this wide geometry of intersecting lines. Lost my place, should have looked up. Uh, yeah, there. Patterns suggest and whisper the ineffable beauty of God, heavenly love, heavenly grace, far past what anyone could speak or see or imagine. The lines wound like a wreath proclaim creation's perfectly honed frame, the world that heaven saw fit to bequeath to men and women, praise be to the name of the world's maker. Artists can create a faint expression of the selfsame thing, a work of art as varied as the state of earth. The etching out of it would bring some recognition of the greater art, the master pattern, well-formed tapestry of what is made, expression of the heart of him who summoned all things forth to be. Now the second poem uh, is related to the first, and as I was thinking about arabesques, I remember that there was always something that uh, the, the artist who would draw an arabesque would do. And I was first going to write about that, but then I was remembering another poem that was written by a, a British poet in the Middle Ages. It was a poem called Pearl, and um, he did the same thing that the artists who did the arabesques did, and he did it for the same reason. So I thought that was very interesting. Different cultures, different religions, different ways of understanding God, and yet the same kind of regard that caused them to do this thing. Uh, so this, uh, this poem is called Imperfect Patterns. Calligraphers of arabesques were practiced in their craft and could arrange a maze of lines into a perfect weave, ends drawn to place, each curve harmonious, patterns repeated true, the mathematics of creation. Yet they left, deliberately, one line misplaced, a flaw done in the, in the symmetry of art, an error, a footnote, placed to say, perfection belonged to God and God alone. A poet in grief far off, northward from where the calligraphers labored, wrote a lament of his daughter's death, a poem called Pearl. The lines, a string of rounded jewels, read in unbroken resonance, syllables arranged, unburied order, regularity. The girl appears and counsels him not to grieve. She is in heaven now, among the blessed. She has a better life. The poem does not vary in its precision until the end. One line is missing, the last pearl gone. Reminder that perfection dwells with God and in his privilege alone. Their peoples fought, but these, the poet, the calligraphers, saw no conflict. Beauty lay in a harbor where no human boat could answer, could anchor. Our attempts at pure creation fall short, and they should. Perfection is the claim of the divine. So even the approach to it, faint imitations of its mechanics, require disclaimers, calls for errors done as signatures of fallenness, notes stating imperfection, so we know our striving cannot claim divinity or join it to our store of earthly goods. Now this last one I said I'm going to do is by another poet, it's a cover. This is by C.S. Lewis. Now, you know, we don't think probably C.S. Lewis is a uh, poet, but he wrote poetry and he in fact wanted to be a poet, but never um, was able to do that entirely. But he did write uh, some very good poems. 
And this poem that he wrote is called The Prodigality of Firdausi. Now Firdausi was a Persian poet, and he wrote an epic called The Shahnama. And The Shahnama is sort of like uh, an epic poem, sort of the Persian equivalent of the Iliad or the Aeneid or something like that, about battles and heroes and wars and kings and love and everything like that. And um, a legend has it that once Ferdowsi wrote the poem and the king and the government read it and liked it, they sent him a bunch of money, quite a bit of money, and he gave it all away, just on the spot, and then went back to his talking. So that's what the poem is about, and it's called The Prodigality of Ferdowsi. Ferdowsi, the strong lion of poets, lean of purse and lean with age, had finished his august mountain of verse, the great Shanama, gleaming glaciered with demon wars, bastioned with Weston's bitter labors and his fendiars, shadowed with Jamshid's grief and glory as with eagle's wings, its foothills dewy forested with the amors of king, clashing with rhymes that rush like snow-fed cataracts blue and cold. And the king commanded to be given him an elephant's burden of gold. Ferdowsi, the carved pillar of poet, was a uh, pillar among poets, was not dear to government. They smiled at the king's word. The grand vizier twisted his pale face, making parsimonious mouths, and said, send the old rhymer 30,000 silver pounds instead, the price of 10 good vineyards and a fine Caucasian girl. Well, this pleased them, and they sent a secretarial shape, a churl, a pick thank without understanding, and a base dissent and bade it deliver their bounty, and with mincing paces, it went. It found the cedar of poets in the baths that day, at ease, discoursing with his friends. Exalted men were they, taking their wine with sugared rose leaves in an airy hall. Poets, or theologians, or saints, or warriors all, or lovers, or astronomers. Like honey drops, the speech distilled in apothegms, or verses from the lips of each on roses, and predestination, and heroic wars, and rhetoric, and the brevity of man, the life of man, and the stars. With courtesy, the lily among poets asked its will. The bearers laid the silver at his feet. The hall was still. The churl grew pale. Ferdowsi beckoned the Nubian slave who had dried their feet. To him, the first 10,000 coins he gave. 10,000 more immediately to the fair-haired boy who waved the fan, saying, My son, may Allah give you joy. And in your grandson's house an unbelieving Frangistan, make it your boast that once you spoke with the splendor of Iran. Lastly, the heaven of the poets, heaven of poets to the churl himself returned the remnant. You look pale, my friend, he said. Well have you earned this trifle for your courtesy and for the heat of the day. And clutching his silver, silently, the creature slunk away, and dogs growled as he passed, and beggars spat. Laughter and shame weighed upon all his progeny, on him Gehenna's flame. Immediately this, the discourse in the baths once more began on the beauty of women and horses and the brevity of the life of man. Thank you. Okay, so I am going to read next, and when I'm done, I'm also going to ask the poets to share with you, so I'm, this is my way of giving them the heads up, um, why they decided to come and share their, and be part of this whole experience. And then maybe that'll encourage you to say, besides I would be in class, this is why I'm glad I came to this, or maybe we can get a little bit of conversation um, before we're done tonight. That sound okay, maybe? You can always pass, right? It's not mandatory. So again, thank you all for coming out. More Salah to Muhammad, and um, I'm gonna read um, a few things for you, and I'm happy to say, along with uh, the other two poets, I too am in this book, and that's all I'll say, because I already said, library get the book people buy it and check it out and um, there are lots of other poetry things going around town so you know find them and seek them out because poetry is great I think 
All right, so I'm going to start with a poem about my hometown. It's called Detroit. Like most overpeopled places, I'm a toilet. I stand before you without facade. I ain't got no identity hangups. My north side harbors once upon a gangsters left with grandiose stories of Negro heydays of pushing and pimping and singing and dancing. They ain't got nothing on my east side, young blooded killers. They don't know their fates, so they still say, what's up, and play ball with you. My south side should have a neon sign. Welcome to wet back Hispanic Latino land where the only thing separating them from the hood is a maybe Spanish accent. Bow tied FOI accosts you on the west side with fruit, bean pies, Mohammed speaks, and enough Malcolm X impersonation to remind one what they used to be. All over I breed people who forgone living any American greeting card lines, opting to hone skills that make survival a most profitable commodity. Women who don't love and those that do until it breaks noses, detaches retinas, kicks fetuses from wombs. Crime that's 100% equal opportunity accompanied by unsexist police ass kickings. That said, give me my props. I once had paradise in an alley. Now I've got Joe Lewis's fist hovering above the place white men meet. That's Detroit. Well, that's my poem about Detroit. So don't go get me in trouble with people in Detroit. I have my own set of issues with my own people in Detroit. Um, but I do want to say a little bit about this piece um, to share with you. I m wrote this poem because and you need to, if you've never seen the statue of Joe Lewis's fist, raise your hand if you've not seen Joe Lewis's fist. All right. All right. Raise your hand if you know the statue I'm talking about. Okay. <laughs> do we not have a gigantic fist hanging in the middle of the street? All right. So Joe Lewis is a boxer. The first time I saw that, I'm like, so we couldn't afford the whole body? I don't know. I mean, why? I was, un I was not happy that Detroit, given our lovely reputation, decided to have a fist only <laughs> in the, as a, a reminder. It's on Woodward? Yeah, it's on Woodward and Jefferson. All right, so I saw this. I'm like, there's got to be a poem in here because <laughs> it's just crazy here. Um, so my last line in that poem really is about the, the all this conflation of ideas and feelings and emotions. So you have, and the fist for other lack of descriptive is black. It's like brown. So basically it's a big black fist in the middle street and it meets at Woodward and Jefferson. So it hovers above the point, the place white men meet. Woodward and Jefferson, historically European settlers earlier in the history. So I did all this history. I'm like, this is so interesting. I gotta write a poem. So that's my little tidbit about my poem in that respect. So I love my, I love Detroit. Um, I'm gonna read a set of poems that I call The Occasion. And they're actually about different occasions. So I'm gonna give a little preview of this. In life, we have significant moments. And so this sort of grew out of me trying to look at different occasions of life and speak and put words on it. Um, so this one is called The Occasion, Wedding. On occasions of two becoming one, little power each has with that creation. How gracious the gift you've now received to savor auspiciously, the grandeur of becoming new. Braving a journey consciously begun, ignorant of what it really means. Please carry with you enough Loving sense to know, though you may falter and stumble, your aim remains to manifest the oneness of this day. Mm, gotta find my other occasion. So of course I had all these set up nice and neat 
before I stand in front of you. The occasion, ecstasy. Not that the dictionary, not that the dictionary says it all, but what you learned at seven years old when your older brother and sister tickled you until the pleasure of laughing gave way to pain, of not being able to stop, of not being in control, of not wanting control, but wanting it because the tickling felt so good, too good to be natural, too good to last, and the agony of your giggles kept rising growing, stretching beyond itself, despite itself, like you at the hand of other fingers rolling frantically over your ribs, under your armpits, and balls of feet until, until, until you burst peeing your pants. It's ecstasy. And this occasion poem, am I going to find it? Uh, I'm not going to find it. The occasion is not opening on my computer. <laughs> All right. So that's enough of the occasions. We're going to move on to this poem which is titled giddy muslim girls had it lost it find it you know i love technology so apparently i just lost my connection and i relied too much on that but guess what? I have more poems that I want to read for you. Um, so this poem is titled Heartless. Today, I am heartless. Looking around, I am finding hardened shades of blue printed skins surrounding eyes staring back from faces like yours. Icy, saddened, Machiavellian words of wars. They cannot end on schedule or any sort of timely, fashionably withdrawal, but only in a style that brings back red, paradoxically in death scenes. A waving young man, a, a waving young woman of 26 smiles too quickly. Her lips wore matured, and fragmented thoughts of missing her father leans too far out her useless armored, armored vehicle, catching death, improvised, and explosively tossed her way like confetti on a parade day. A beautiful young man of 54 minus 34 years of never fathering another remembers kissing the woman who would be his wife, sees his once living parents too soon after fighting for and against nations unable to honor his life or death. A teen awakens one morning with an idea planted in her heart. She dresses for school and wears the ideal accessory she walks out of her family home into a market where she releases death like captive fireflies. I am heartless. It is true. I am no starfish. It will not grow back. I am no demon. What you say, if these children be heartless, blue-hued, icy-eyed combatants or collaterally damaged Um, this piece is titled, Instead God Said Be. And I wrote this 
All right, first of all, you need to know that for the last few years, the Grand Rapids Art Museum have this thing called Poetry on Demand, usually in April. So you need to remember this for next year because you all will remember this, right? Write it down. Next year at the Graham. It's called Poetry on Demand. And you can go there on that night and there are poets sitting next to artwork that they've interpreted. And you can demand their poem as many times as you want to. So it's <laughs> a couple of my uh, fellow poets have experienced that before. It's fun. So I wrote this piece. It's called Instead God Said Be. And it interprets a painting by Mark, Sh um, Mark Schinkman. And you can see this piece at the Graham. It was once part of an uh, art prize. And so you find Mark Schinkman. He's going to kill me for butchering his name on tape like a bunch of times. I'm sorry. <laughs> OK, so it's called Instead God Said Be. Creation stories abound overflowing mind from every religious angle, making children scream because their choices are hell, heaven, or nostalgic indifference lost in pining for a supposed time when neither choice existed, where one man and one woman romped around naked but didn't know it. Apparently, before heaven, hell, and unashamed naked people, there was nothing. In the beginning, or there was everything, which makes more godly sense. Where there is God, there has to be everything. So in the beginning, there was everything. When God woke up or regained consciousness or created it, decisions had to be made about the business of being. After too much thought, planning, and eons of angel kiss-up suggestions as they vie for positions with the now conscious God. Time, had it existed, slipped away until it invented boredom, which the now conscious God of everything found annoying such a state developed on godly watch. In the beginning of a smoldering thickness of everything, God stood at its midnight middle looked at the boredom of plans, scraped them, and instead said, be. Sending everything, not nothing, to the ends of space as bees sound floated in whispering smoky gray white tendrils across creation's blackened, richly layered canvas of everything, endlessly becoming and unbecoming. Thank you. So it is only about 10 minutes after 8. And again, we were down three poets. So just imagine what you would have to talk about if they were here. So, think about so I would like, if you don't mind the poets, um, again, considering what we're here for, for trying to open our minds and be inclusive and you know see something more than the person visually that we may see in front of us and trying to get the rest of the story. If you don't mind sharing, I sent an email out and said, hey, to the poets that I know and that we're having this event, would you like to come and share something? And so I'd like to give them opportunity to, to share with you why they decided to come and then see if we have a little conversation and that's, then I'll be done. Okay, who would like to come? We don't have to do any kind of order. We have to come and share, there you go. <laughs> I don't know if you heard that. I've been around here the, the longest. I went to CC when it was JC. That's how long ago. I've been here. But um, I grew up in Grand Rapids, except for attending uh, College of Michigan State. I've been here my whole life. And it's amazing to me to see, and maybe for some of you who are obviously you're all younger, maybe it doesn't seem that different to you, but when I was your age, most people couldn't wait to get out of Grand Rapids. If you'd go to a party, the, the conversation was, I can't wait to get out of here. When, when can I leave? I'm never coming back. Uh, and at the time, Grand Rapids was considered by many the, the largest small town in America. Uh, everybody knew everybody's business. There was pretty much you know, the Puritan ethic you've read about that was prevalent here. Uh, if you said uh, even a, a minor epithet out loud, you, you risk going to jail for it. So 
when I had the opportunity to come and do this, part of it was because of that past that I've experienced, and I had the opportunity to come and be part of this event so I could show people not only how different it was, but to feel some of that myself, to some of, some of that freedom in being able to share with people what culture has become in West Michigan. I mean, we still have a long ways to go, but at least we're getting there step by step. So that's my story. Now, if anybody has any questions, I'll answer them. Uh, once again, my name is Carrie Moss, and um, I take a creative writing class here at CC with David Cope. And I heard about this poetry reading because I write poems with um, esoteric and Quranic references from time to time. And when I heard it was a Muslim poetry reading, then he just recommended that I come, so I came. <laughs> Once again, peace. Um, I decided to come today because um, I just think that this was a good opportunity for me to share. Um, I'm not much of a public speaker, but I do like poetry. So when I'm able to be able to uh, use my words in that way and speak in public, then it makes it easier for me to share. Um, uh, like she mentioned earlier, I come from a family of writers, some singers, so this is um, a wonderful opportunity to, for me to be able to share different uh, poems that I may not read out in other locations. Um, does anybody have any questions? Okay, thank you. I guess I'm the only one left, so. Um, trying to put this in some kind of order, I think I'll start with the poems. We all have poems that we really, really like. Um, you know, we all have our favorites. And the cover that I read tonight, which was the C.S. Lewis poem about the Persian poet Ferdowsi, has always been one of my favorite poems. I've always liked it. Uh, I, when I thought about reading it here, I'm walking around the house, and I noticed I've got it almost memorized, not because I tried to memorize it, because just because I've read it so many times. And I think um, when I saw this reading that it was going to do with Muslim culture, of course that poem immediately came to mind. And I'm always interested in sort of the interplay of cultures. And uh, so, you know, I thought, okay, here's Lewis, and, you know, he's generally identified as a Christian apologist, and, you know, he wrote Christian allegories and children's books and theology's books. And yet he seemed to have a, just a real deep, genuine appreciation for Ferdowsi and his poetry, and also for the culture that he, he came from, you know, his description of, of the men, you know, that they were exalted, they were theologians, they were warriors, they were poets, they were lovers, they were speaking in verse, you know, which, uh, you know, poets in the old days used to do that, you know, they would talk to each other in, in, in verses, and, you know, and, and that was universal, you know, we had that in, in all cultures of the world. And so, um, you know, I always thought that that was his, his appreciation, even as one who was outside of the culture. And the fact that in a day when there was not most, uh, not as much, oh, how do you say, translation, uh, emphasis on multiculturalism like there is today. You know, we'll go to a class today and we'll, we'll read African, we'll read Asian, you know, we'll, we'll read literature from all lands. Uh, in the 40s, when he wrote this poem, that was not as widespread. And the fact that he was able to probably read it in translation, I don't think he spoke Persian, but to, you know, they took the trouble to find and to read and to interpret that poem even in that day when that kind of thing was not done as much as it is today. I thought it was pretty remarkable. And so uh, that poem and those things about it have always stuck in my mind and have always uh, been, I think, as a teacher, I teach out at Grand Valley and I teach world literature sometimes and uh, uh, classes that uh, sort of uh, uh, 
call for a certain amount of multiculturalism and this thing of cultural overlap and cultural communication and understanding other cultures, appreciating other cultures, and understanding the historical interaction between those cultures has always fascinated me. So I kind of, I jumped at this when I saw the announcement for it. I said, yeah, me. I didn't feel very qualified to do it, but you know, uh, I, I got in anyway. So does anyone have any questions on that? Or anything like that? Yes, ma'am. <laughs> okay, well, thank you, thank you. Anybody else? Yes, sir. I think it's a good idea uh, because there are, you know, like I said, it's not like we, we, we tend to think that there's a vacuum, but there's not. There is a lot of cultural overlap. Uh, you know, like say Lewis reads for Dowsey's poems, uh, Ezra Pound studied Japanese poetry. What's that? Right, right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so I think it's good because it puts us on to different kinds of poetry. I really like, uh, you know, now these, these are the old-fashioned pronunciations of their name. I think they translate them different today, but Li Po and Tu Pu, you know, the, the two leading Chinese poets. Um, there, there are things in their poetry that say they do really well that Western poets don't do as well. Say the, 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 the poetry of sort of absence, the poetry of indirection, the poetry of understatement, you know. Read Chinese or Japanese poetry and, you know, you, you get that so well. Uh, um, so, you know, reading broadly like that, I think it's just a good idea. I think it will improve your craft as a poet. I think it will open your mind to different styles. Now, usually I find that the thing in those poems that I like is not absent in Western poetry, but it's, it's just, it's, it's more emphasized in other poems, okay? So Western poets do what Li Po and Tu Fu do, but Li Po and Tu Fu really do it, you know, uh, to perfection. And so, yeah, I, you know, required, I don't know that required's ever a good word to use for a poet, but I, I think it's profitable. I think it's really a good idea to study uh, culture and to study poems from other continents, other cultures, you know, other, other uh, societies. Uh, yeah, you know, translation is a whole subject that you can get onto, and uh, you know, you I, I think you just capture as much of it as you can. Uh, for instance, I um, I took one of Lee Poe's poems one time. It was called uh, We Three. It's one of his famous poems. Lee Poe liked to get drunk. That's one thing I like about him. He has all these poems about getting drunk, you know. And so he has a poem about getting drunk under the moon, and he's by himself, but he says, wait a minute, my sha the moon's there, and my shadow, that makes us three. Let's dance. Let's have a party, the three of us, you know. Well, you know, the Chinese wrote very formal poetry, at least Li Po and Tu Fu did, where you arranged letters in certain, you only had so many characters, ideographs that you could use. Now, how do you duplicate that in English? Well, I wrote it as a sonnet, you know. And okay, it was... An approximation, I think, pretty well of what the poem said. And the sonnet style represents the formalism of the Chinese poem. Now, it's not in any way like it, but at least it's an attempt, I think, to approximate that he wrote a very formal poem. Well, what's our most formal style of poetry? Well, maybe it's the sonnet. Uh, so those kinds of things. I do believe in, I hope I'm not getting too long-winded, I do believe in a dynamic equivalence translation. That is, I, I don't think you should slavishly uh, translate word for word. Now, um, translation that Sir Thomas Wyatt did of, uh, of um, I want to say Boccaccio, it's not Boccaccio, um, the, the, my, my, my galley, you know, he did. In the original, it's literally, I sail between Scylla and Charybdis, yeah, I'll, I'll finish here, and, uh, um, you know, that, that, that's a literal translation. But he said, I'm sailing between ragged rocks. You know, he didn't try to do an exact translation of it. But I've seen other translations that are more literal, and I still think his translation is the best because it captures the spirit of the poem, even though it's not an exact translation. 
So I, I think you can do pretty well if you know the language well enough to understand the spirit of the poem, to understand its dynamic, and to try to approximate that as well as you can in English. And, you know, you'll never do that, you know. Uh, I read something like uh, Baudelaire's The Cats in French and read some Latin poems. I know a little Latin. And there's some things that you just can't translate, some things that are just funny in Latin that there's no way to convey it in English. But, uh, but you do the best you can, and, and I think people have done, on occasion, a pretty, uh, pretty good job of it. Other questions? Or? Well, actually, we actually have our, one of our poets has sh showed up. So oh, great, great, very good. Um, and I know when you came in, you were all dying to hear poetry to 9 o'clock anyway. <laughs> so what are you t don't look at me like that. But here's something you want to, um, uh, two things. One thing to address what you said. I think everybody needs to, not just poetry, but you need to get outside of what you know. As a human being, you need to get outside what you know. Because you need to understand, we need to understand each other. And here's my quick example. When I was in college, so many people did not understand me simply mainly because of my name. Um, I had a, a, a friend of mine who, well, he wasn't really, he was like a friend of me. You know, he's like, he just irritated me all the time and he thought it was fun. And one day I, I um, wrote this down and I slid it under his door and he left me alone from that point. And the reason I know he left me alone because he knew absolutely nothing about Islam or Muslims. And what I wrote down was, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen, Rahman ar-Rahim Malik Yomadini, Yakin Abu Duba, Yakin Astain, Haddina Surat al-Mustaqim, Surat al-Adina Namta alayhim, Qadr al-Makdubi alayhim, Wala Dolina, Ameen. And I wrote that down, slid on his door. He left me alone for like a year. And then he came to me and he said, you know what? I finally had somebody translate that for me. And it's not a hex. I was like, what? <laughs> right? This is why we need to know each other. Because. But, you know, I, I, sometimes I feel bad. I just wanted him to leave me alone. And I knew he didn't know anything. So if I said something to him in Arabic, he would go away. And he did. Until he took that initiative to find out what it meant, and he, meant, and he found out it didn't mean anything bad at all. That's why we need to get outside. All right, so the other thing I wanted to let you know is that poets, now this is, I don't know, creative people, I'm going to stick with poets because they're poets tonight. They will do everything they can to come and share. And G. Foster was running late tonight for a couple, you know, work, and his father actually is in the hospital, so he had to take care of some family things, but he said, I'm going to get there, I'm going to be here, and he's here. So since he is, please, can we give a welcome to G. Foster. You guys can just call me Foster. That's what, that'll work. Uh, thank you for inviting me. Uh, definitely got me outside of the normal realm of uh, spoken word poetry. Um, introduced me to some new people as well. I found like uh, a couple of interesting people, but I just I wrote with the first one because I just thought it just really like jumped out at me. Uh, the person's name was um, Francisco De Leon, and uh, this is actually on IslamicPoetry.org, and I went there and um, checked it out, and um, like it just just grasped me right away, like. The name of the uh, poem is called Eyes of the Outsider, and I think that um, it definitely just, like I said, it kind of motivated me to like to take a look at it from the outside as well, and uh, to look like, although like I, I did live in Detroit, I did take a few uh, uh, Arabic classes, and uh, like working in Detroit, like uh, Dearborn is re really close to them, uh, Detroit, and they have a large uh, Islamic and uh, Arabic um, influence in the area. Um, but the name of the poem is Eyes of the Outsider. I looked at the men who bowed in, in the day to the strange music that played, the voice hypnotizing. They say Islamic faith is corrupt. But if they look, they are corrupt. They see what they wish to see. But from outsiders' eyes, I see beauty. I see sand sweeping soft melodies. I hear children play. I cry for understanding of two faiths. I fear for the imp I fear the impending, but I open my arms to Allah. 
And uh, even though that was just like a short poem, I just felt like that one just is very powerful. And it uh, inspired me to write a short poem as well. And it's called uh, She. She is covered, humbled, preserved, reserved, poised, almost mummified in exotic silk. She, to me, is cheekbones, eyelashes, dark eyes closely resembling charcoal, but warming like a fire on a cold desert night. Her voice demands respect, and her, demand, and her intelligence could demean a theory. Her hands are worn, but softer than the first dew of the morning. To long for what I cannot see in this physical world is almost blasphemous. I am speaking of no one in particular, rather an idea of the unknown, that one day I will understand more. I speak of knowledge. Um, like I said, short poem, short poem, it just, it just uh, motivated me. Uh, and there were quite a few other speakers that, uh, oh, I'm sorry, poets that jumped out at me, but like I come from the uh, spoken word background, but, um, and we have a, a ton of events. Like I actually just started my own poetry night at uh, Stella's Lounge, it's called The Drunk Retort. Please feel free to come through. Uh, and then we also do it every Wednesday at the Hookah Lounge, East Town Hookah Lounge from uh, 9.30 to 11.30ish. And <laughs> Stella's every Monday night. Yep, every Monday night from nine to 11. So like the poetry in West Michigan, uh, sp particularly Grand Rapids has been uh, growing. Uh, Mercilada has been coming. Like she surprises everybody and shows up every once in a while. Uh, Arnon was here, or d did Arnon show up tonight? All right. Our nine showed up on one day, and uh, he is a, a good poet. But uh, I mean, we actually have a forum and a place for all of us to to uh, discuss and express. So I mean, if you guys definitely feel like that and want to be motivated to write, come out and hear some new people and different ideas. And I think that's definitely what um, culture is about. Like you, you said that about it. If you want to be able to understand, I mean, if you've never left Grand Rapids, then I feel bad for you right now, man. Like. <laughs> Like it's so much across the water, man. So, uh, anybody have any questions? Anything? You want me to do a different piece? Uh, another piece? All right. This is called "These Are Our Words." Right now, press record as I retort my retro rhetoric. Reevaluate wrongs so they may be righted. So consider this reeducation. The right response would be to respond. Rebel-minded folks get ready to revolt. See, my good friend Azizi said to revolutionize, we need revolutionize. And mine are a registered weapon, refocused and reopened, ready to shoot. Shots fired, shots fired, shots fired. Right now, our rogue world is realizing that it needs resuscitation, revitalization. Will you react or be re-victimized in this ruckus world referred to as a real good life? See, we have roamed and roved and wretched in a retarded manner, but now I require you to retaliate. Shots fired, shots fired, shots fired. Right now, I'm giving you a real raw retrospective as I rap. Rethink, rewind, and replay Robert Marley over and over, ride my rhythm, rock on. Reset the repetitive, retake what was repossessed, rep you right now. Recapture what escapes, reattach the broken pieces of your heart, really be human, react. Shots fired, shot fired, shots fired. Right to bear arms, respect my rights. You so far left, you don't respect the right to life. Reexamine these re-elections, these regurgitated, repeat mistakes reek. In your eyes, I'm a nigger. In my eyes, you're a re-nigger. Shots fired, shots fired, shots fired. Really look at these right-wing Republicans. Read between the lines. Write your representatives. Re-establish our rights. Re-enact real votes before we get a rotten, run realistic Romney and ransacked. Shots fired, shots fired, shots fired. Right now, there is a rapid transition in this realm, and I smell a rat. The ratio of poverty to rich needs to be recalculated, rebutted, recalled, and redistributed before radicals get radical and riot. Red rum reversed. Shots fired, shots fired, shots fired. Regrettably, this racket remains. We are getting raped in the rear with the rod that ruins relatives, relationships, and causes racism and recidivism to rain down re uh, repeatedly as a ramification repeatedly until we rise and remove these restraints. Shots fired, shots fired, shots fired. Right now, I'm ready, are you? I'm ready to be the rare rap ruthless rascal run amok with raging, resonating, remarkable, rash, and reckless rants that starts rallies. Shots fired, shots fired, shots fired. Your rank can't rule out my roaring, launching, ravaging repair. That's my repertoire. I'd have to repel, and you can't unravel that string. Roll with me or get rolled over. I'm out of your range, Rover. Rewind. 
Your rank can't rule out my roaring, raunchy, ravaging repair. That's my repertoire. I'd have to repel, and you can't unravel that string. Roll with me or get rolled over. I'm out of your Range Rover. Shots fired, shots fired, shots fired. Right now, recognize rage. 27 recalls resembling those resting in peace from what happened right in the Connecticut school. Remember how the media reports and reminds that we don't rehabilitate those that rely on us for help. This is remorse for our remiss. Shots fired, shots fired, shots fired. Rebound and rely on the relic religion. Reflect on the regions of the world and refuge that can't regenerate. Then it's a reduction. This regime, this republic that I once loved now repulses me. I didn't request this. No refund, no receipt. We have been robbed right under our noses. It's redundant and rough. Shots fired, shots fired, shots fired. Reconnect to this radiant, rotating, round planet, reunion with its inhabitants, referendum, redemption. We are all connected in a roundabout way, realize with real eyes, reopen, refocus, show respect, forget revenue, reflect, revelé, or get shot. That's my revelation. Thank you. So that concludes our program for the night. It is just a little past 8.30, but I suggest taking like three minutes, five minutes, and if you wanted to talk to any one of the poets, or you have, oh good, we have a question from the audience, yes. or comment. Oh, okay, class um, time. At this time in the program, we are taking volunteers to read. Do we have anybody out there who wants to come and share something? teacher asked. I'm just reiterating what the teacher asked. Oh, I thought you were asking them to share something. Oh, that's why they look so like, are you, what are you saying? Okay, never mind. Yes. I was going to say, or you are on one of these judging shows. That's what you said. Well, you know, I really like how you came. <laughs> yes, thank you. And, and you know that what one of them, I think Foster said it best, you know, this got some of us outside our box and we discovered literature that we may not have looked at before. Uh-huh. Uh, I have a question. I, normally this question might be a little bit inappropriate for considering we're talking about diversity of culture. Um, I would actually am really curious to know um, the diversity between all the speakers. Um, well, come on down, people. Come on. Uh, what, do you, what, what do you mean? What? Oh, okay. So, I don't know. Like, like, what kind of Christian are you? Like, or what kind of Muslim are you? Are you? No. Oh. Okay. Did any of our poets? Yeah, go. Yeah, I'm a little bit of, well, you know, it's my, and, and my, my parents converted to Islam under um, the Nation of Islam um, in the 60s, and, um, but my mother is very interesting. She, my, my take on religion really stems from what she says, because my mom was Baptist, and I think she looked at Catholicism, and she looked at Jehovah's Witness. My mom shopped religions. And 
And that's one of the questions I asked her when I got older because really all the stories my brothers and sister told me, it just seemed like they had such a better life when they were Christians because they, they talk about all this. It was just a different, I can't even, you have to come to my office and I'll explain to you. But, but they were saying like, oh, really, I felt, I felt really um, punished a little bit because I couldn't celebrate anything. I went to school and we didn't, we didn't celebrate anything. And all my friends celebrated all these holidays and I didn't do that. And my brothers and sisters, they um, used to tell me about Christmas dinner. And I was like, that, that ham thing you're talking about right now, that sounds incredibly wonderful, I wonder. So I didn't have those experiences. But it was interesting because on the flip side of that, when I asked my mom, why Islam? You know, why is this? And what she said is, I've looked at a lot of different religions because I've been looking for a place that made sense to me and that would answer my questions. And when I converted to Islam, it answered all my questions without giving me another one. So I thought, that's the perfect test for your religion or your belief. If it answers your question, it makes you, and it doesn't have this thing, other thing lingering. So if you ask me, like I won't ever, I, I, true, I usually never say I'm what a test of being any sort of kind of this is my religion. If people back me into a corner or something, I'll say, well, you know, I believe that there's one God and I believe we have more in common than we think we do. Um, but if you want me to name something, I'll name the thing that I'm most familiar with, and that's Islam. So that's kind of where I am now. It's been for a long time. Any other comments or questions from the floor? If not, again, I'd like to give you all a round of applause for coming out. That's our poets we have for you. Thanks for coming. And remember to check out the website and the library um, next year for the other events that they'll be having. And again, if you have five minutes, you want to have a conversation with us one-on-one, -on -one, do that before you skip out and say goodbye. Good night. Oh, excuse me. <laughs>